In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Our text from Luke's Gospel, chapter 8 today, is the parable of the sower. And this parable, like last week's parable of the workers in the vineyard, Jesus used common images of his day that Jewish people then would have been very familiar with. And, and then he used this to teach an important spiritual lesson. And the lesson for today has to do with the doctrine of God's word and its effectiveness to produce Christian. At the same time, we hear that there are dangers, pitfalls, and enemies that threaten the production of strong and mature Christians. Indeed, we see in Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower that the devil, trials and persecution, the love of riches all work against us and can prevent us from being saved in the first place and then be so troublesome that even the believer, when encountering these trials and afflictions, will lose their salvation. And so there's a great warning in this parable. Watch out. The Christian life is fraught with dangers. Pay attention carefully then this morning and consider the great importance of God's word and the proper response to it. Learn after today to examine yourself and avoid spiritual danger so that you will always find yourself among the elect, that little group represented by the seed in the good soil. Now our text follows the fact that Jesus had become very popular at this point. He had preached to many. He had done many different kinds of miracles. People were healed of evil spirits and infirmities. People were encouraged that even as poor common folk, they too could be a part of God's kingdom. And by now, at the time of our text, a great crowd had gathered around Jesus. And he knew that not everyone was the same who followed him and who heard his preaching. Most, in fact, would reject his preaching. Some would start to believe but fall away, but there was that small group that would humbly accept his word and through patience produce the godly fruit and habits that our Heavenly Father finds so pleasing. And so to warn the people, warn his hearers to properly receive God's word, Jesus told this parable of the sower who sowed the seed and the seed fell on four different types of soil, representing the four different types of responses to God's word. Maybe there are even more different responses to his word, but Jesus had these four to teach us this is enough to know. Now, why didn't Jesus just talk plainly about the importance of preaching, the importance of humbly receiving God's word with repentance, and the importance of persevering in the faith? He could have. He could have told them just directly that, hey, God's word is important. Watch out that you treat it properly because these dangers can happen once you receive the word. But Jesus spoke in a parable, and it served two purposes. First, for those who truly wanted a better life and God's approval, parables acted as a stimulant. It, it, it prompted them to investigate and scratch their heads and go, hmm, what does he mean by this? And it caused them to investigate and learn more what God was actually saying and this is shown in the disciples who asked about the parable later. What did you mean by this? And this is the habit of true believers to this day. They want to learn and grow in God's word. And I hope this describes you. But for those who in their hearts did not want to hear about sin and cared little about improving themselves, who saw Jesus as a source of entertainment, then the parable was a big mystery and they were kept from understanding. In other words, Jesus' parables were a way to separate the wheat from the chaff, the righteous from the wicked, which will be finalized on the 
last day. Call it prejudgment, if you will. Now let's consider Jesus' explanation of the parable that he gave to the disciples. He said plainly that the seed represents the word of God. So right off the bat, again, we have to alert ourselves to the great value of God's word. It is the only way, friends, the only way to true spiritual life that God finds pleasing. Without God's word, there is no germination, there's no growth, there's no spiritual fruit. In other words, there is only God's strict judgment. What about the sower, those who sow the seed? Who does that represent? Jesus didn't say. But exercising God's gift of the imagination, which we always must do to properly understand the Bible and theology, it's easy to understand that the sower represents Jesus, the apostles, and anyone today who preaches God's word. The Apostle Paul affirmed this when he wrote to the church in Rome that no one can call on the name of the Lord and be saved unless they first hear the gospel preached. But how can someone preach unless he's called and sent to preach? And so preachers are important friends. They are the sowers of the seed. Through them, the seed of God's word is preached and people are saved. This is the only way People are saved. Now, Jesus went on to say the four different plots of land that the seed fell on represent the four different reactions to the preached word. They represent four classes of Christians, or at least those who call themselves Christians having heard the word. And as for those who, who don't hear God's word, they are obviously lost. They're not considered or discussed in the parable. You have to have God's word and hear the gospel preached to be saved. Again, this is what Paul taught. But all is not well with these four classes of Christians. Three out of four end up useless and ruined. They produce no spiritual life that God desires. And so this parable teaches us how hard it is for anyone to be saved and keep the faith. So when you do find yourself confident of God's grace and your faith in Jesus Christ, give praise to God and, and honor him alone as the author of salvation. Now let's consider each class, each soil in more detail. The first group, the seed along the path, are those who hear God's word, but it is not received in their hearts. It's stolen by the devil, and their hearts remain stony and cold. They do not believe, and they have no true love of God in their hearts. Now, again, this is not to say that these people in the first group don't claim to be Christians. They do. Consider the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day. They claimed to be godly. They claimed to be the descendants of Abraham. They claimed to know the scriptures. But they actually were unbelieving enemies of God. The devil stole the word out of their hearts. When Jesus preached, it went in one ear and out the other, and their hearts became hardened to the truth of the gospel. And so today, people belong to this group who, like Judas, can fool everyone into thinking that they're pious Christians. They attend divine service on Sunday morning, they get confirmed, they go to the sacrament, but they don't actually believe. Their hearts remain cold and impenitent. They are sinners who never bother to change or become better. And these so-called Christians in this first group here lead others to believe that they're full of good works. And they would, to the eye, appear to do many good works, but these good works don't issue forth from true love of God in their hearts. They're done out of pride. They're done out of self-interest, 
These are those that I mentioned last week, the, the false Christians of Matthew 7, who on judgment day expect to be saved and say, Lord, did, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Look at all the mighty works we did, Lord, for you. And yet Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So let's learn from the tragedy of this first group and learn to examine our hearts that we've humbly received the word of God and believe it and seek to please God with a holy life. Let's hear God's word, as James says, and put it into practice. Let's be willing to look in the mirror and be willing to see sin and want to do better. At the same time, let's learn to rejoice in Christ and his work, believe in him, and be refreshed with the gospel and the forgiveness of sins. Let's move on to the second group. This is where the seed fell on the rock or rocky soil. It represents those who hear the gospel and at first receive it with joy. They become genuine Christians who understand that salvation is by grace through faith. They are truly intent on hearing God's word and growing in it. But when a time of testing comes, persecution, and their bodies and their bank accounts and their livelihood are threatened, then they wilt and fall away from the faith. Prior to this, they will accept the Bible's doctrine of suffering intellectually, but when the rubber hits the road and they see that a true, pure confession of Christ and his word means the scorn and censure of family and friends, when they see that a true testimony and confession of Christ means fines, imprisonment, loss of work, etc. They lose the faith. And if they don't outright deny God's word, well, I don't believe that anyway, they just remain silent about it. When the pressure is on, they hide in the shadows and avoid suffering for Jesus' name, thinking their faith can remain intact just by being silent. But they're wrong. There were many Jews in Jesus' day who were a part of this group. They heard Jesus preach. They were enlightened by the gospel of the forgiveness of sins. Hey, this is great. Even among the scribes and the Pharisees, this was so. But when they learned that if they confessed Christ and publicly said, I'm a Christian, I stand on the scriptures and what the apostles and Christ himself teach, when they learned that confessing the faith like this meant being labeled a troublemaker and being put out of the synagogue, then they wilted and, and kept quiet. The scripture teaches that this is making a shipwreck of your faith. Even Peter and the disciples found themselves in this group when Jesus arrested. In the garden, Jesus arrested, and the text says they all fled. They were afraid. I don't want to suffer like Jesus. Wow. Praise be to God, there is redemption for those who have found themselves in this group when they repent and accept the afflictions and sufferings that God has so appointed. Peter was redeemed. So were the leavened who remained in the faith. Having, he, Peter denied the Lord and was restored, and so can you. But friends, hear, hear God's word here. Put your life, your family, your job, your income in God's hand and be willing to lose them. Be willing to be fired from your job, to lose friends, to be scorned by the world rather than denying God, his word, his commandment, his doctrines, his gospel. 
Oh, the great number of casualties of Christians who started off well and were derailed by a fleshly fear of suffering. May God help us all to keep the faith even when the stakes are down and we must suffer for it. And friends, with God's help, we will endure. Hallelujah. Let's move on to the third group. These are those people described by Jesus as a seed that fell among thorns that ended up uh, choking out the plants. He said that they are those who hear the gospel and it began to grow and then all spiritual life is choked out and, and the phrase there is used, the cares and riches and pleasures of life. Friend, Satan is one tricky creature. He is often called the master of a thousand arts. And of all the tricks that Satan has to derail a Christian from entering the narrow door of salvation, I'm inclined to think that this is the most successful. It seems to be very successful here in America. All Satan has to do is dangle in our minds the various pleasures and comforts that money brings to set a Christian on the wrong path. We can't avoid money. But we can avoid making it an idol. And Jesus teaches this by saying to us, what good is it if you gain the whole world and provide yourself all the comforts of this life but forfeit your soul? Keep money at arm's length. Keep the comforts that money brings at arm's length. This, include, this group here includes then all those who take, make the comforts of this life their first priority. This is making money an idol. That friends, Jesus has said, you cannot serve both God and money. Either you will worship God and be willing to live with little but enough, or you worship money and you have more, but you lose God and eternal salvation. And don't think that this is a warning to just rich people. It's a warning to poor people, very poor. Because greed is a matter of the heart, which isn't apparent on the outside. This warning against keeping money and the pleasures of this life at arm's length is especially something that young families need to be aware of. It's so easy to be caught up paying the bills and paying off the house and taking vacations and taking kids here and there and spiritual life and concern for God's word gets choked. But it's a warning for single people, for retired people, for people with great jobs and for people with little or no jobs. Watch out. When you have been provided for, and your bank account's healthy, watch out. Be willing to be generous. If you're not careful, greed will enter your heart and you'll make a shipwreck of your faith. Let's trust then that God will take care of all the needs of our body. Learn, friends, to ask for your daily bread as we do in the Lord's Prayer, knowing then that you will be provided for. And let's learn to put our flesh in check. We just simply do not need all the comforts and securities and pleasures that we think we need. Let's consider the fourth group. These are those described by Jesus as the seed that fell on the good soil. He said, these are those who hear the word of God and believe it, and they cling to it through thick and thin. These are the true Christians who are humble and patient and end up producing the fruit and the crop, the good works that stem from faith that God finds so pleasing. These are those who hear God's word, who think about it, who meditate on it, who learn it, who memorize it, no matter how many times they've gone over it, and they seek to better themselves and apply themselves to God's commandments. These are those who rejoice daily in the forgiveness of sins won for them by Christ on the cross. And they're willing 
to suffer. And they're willing to go without various fleshly pleasures in order to please God and imitate their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. None of this is ever done perfectly. But they learn and they pick themselves up when they stumble and refresh themselves with the gospel, but then they keep going. But this little group of true Christians is small indeed. It's the smallest by far of the four. But God wants us to be a part of this little group. He wants us to be honest and true Christians. And he's gracious to put us in this little group. But again, we must be willing to learn and grow in his word and suffer for it too. Again, I mentioned this earlier that this text teaches us something uh, humbling. It teaches us uh, how hard it is for true and honest Christians to be produced. And it shows how few of us there actually are. It would seem like it's a precarious thing to be a Christian. The dangers are so great. But let's trust that just like our Old Testament text says, when God's word is preached, he puts power into it through the Holy Spirit such that true faith can happen and does happen. And when you find yourself comforted by the gospel and the forgiveness of sins, you can say, praise God, I'm baptized. I'm going to heaven. Lord, help me to enter through that narrow door. Keep me from sin, from those things that would bring shame to your name. Indeed, friends, while we have breath, there is hope that that seed that we hear will grow into great fruit. Let's be alert to the spiritual dangers in life and with God's help, avoid them. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.